At Hackensack Meridian Health, we believe the best health care is perfectly orchestrated. Researchers working with doctors to treat the most complex conditions. Specialists identifying problems sooner. And everything you need from primary care to emergency care, home health to rehab, is all perfectly in tune. Here, when everyone works together, your world gets better. Hackensack Meridian Health. Life years ahead. Welcome to Define You Radio. Class is in session with your host, the Southern Belle of Bold, Valencia Griffin Wallace. Are you ready to unapologetically build your confidence, achieve goals, and design a life worth living? Learn the life lessons and strategies to define your life, money, and business. Pins and papers ready. Class is now in session. Yes, yes, and yes. Welcome to Define You Radio, where you get life lessons from women who have defined their life, money, and business. I am your host, the Southern Belle of Bold, Valencia Griffin Wallace. And to connect with the show live, head on over to the Define You Radio's Facebook page, where I will be peeping for you guys' comments, reactions, and so on about tonight's show, which I'm really excited about, okay? So today's session is with a young lady I had the privilege of meeting when I took my epic road trip and went to speak in Canada a few months ago, which you guys know I am the Southern Belle of Bold, right? So I am used to April, I believe it was April, uh, being quite warm Mm -hmm. here in Louisiana. And when I got to Canada, I was traumatized, shocked, but it was a great experience. Um, You have to learn how to convert stuff. And apparently there's a button (laughs) in my car, (laughs) which I discovered this on the trip, guys. Uh, So if you ever cross from the States into Canada, and, you know, other places that, you know, may not use miles per hour, check your car, because my car actually had a way I could set it to change it to, uh, what is it, uh, kilometers per hour or something of that. So I wasn't speeding or I was good. It was very interesting. I learned some things. So um, <laughs> me and our guest tonight, we... After the conference, we got an opportunity to really get to know each other. And we sat in in my car and we talked for a while. And life is funny. And it has a funny way of giving you an understanding of things. Like some of you guys, I have watched the show Hoarders. I even have had a client in my other business that was a, a hoarder, so to speak. And like some of you, I was dumbfounded and I didn't understand the why behind it. And maybe because I'm such an organized person. So anything that's not organized is like completely opposite of who, just who I am, my general makeup. So we are talking to my friend and former (laughs) hoarder, (laughs) Miss Angel (laughs) Peterson, to give us a lesson on how she healed from hoarding and how she found herself worth. And I will tell you guys that it is class, class is truly in session today. So make sure you have your pens and papers ready because you will learn some things you never thought you would learn. And it'll make you look at your life and your behavior and see how close or how much stuff you have in common with with Angel. So with that being said, guys, uh, class is now in session. I want to go ahead and welcome my friend, the beautiful Angel Peterson, to the show. (laughs) Thank you so much. What a nice introduction. And and thank you for introducing me as a young, young lady. (laughs) Um, I'm, I'm, sometimes have a hard time relating to that these days, but uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Un- understandable, understandable. And we're all young. You know, sometimes I feel feel younger than my age. Sometimes I feel my age and sometimes I feel older. I don't know if you saw the post I did uh, 
the other day that, I, you know, I'm that neighbor that will look out my blinds and take pictures and report you to the homeowners oh, yes. association. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I was like, when did I become that person? But I am very much that, um, yeah, I'm that person. So I guess I don't know mm-hmm. if that makes me older or what that that's funny. So, Angel, thank you so much for being on. Um, I know we have a lot to talk about, so I kind of just want to dig in. And I want you to go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about you as a as a person, as a speaker, as as just the awesome person you are. Why don't you go ahead and share you (laughs) with the audience? Sure. Okay. So I am. I'm currently a single mother of four children. My oldest is is a is an adult now. She's 22. Um, And my youngest is 10. So when I was, uh, when I was growing up, I had a great childhood up until about, well, it was still probably great, but up until about six years old, that's when my parents split up. And when my dad left, I kind of, I had this uh, something that was missing. And that's, I think when it started, the attachment to physical things, to um, to toys that he'd given me, or a dress that he thought I was to, that he that he liked me, and or something that that I could hold on to, that was like having him around without him being around. So I think mm. that's kind of where it started. Um, and then of course when I'd go visit my dad, um, my mom, being the very lovely lady she is, very very clean lady. She'd go into my room and um, narrow things down. So she'd she'd take um, the extra, I guess, and get rid of it. So I'd come home and I'd be missing toys or or whatnot. And that kind of that kind of fueled that uh, that attachment to things as well, like my need to hold on to my things. Um, then as an adult. As many of us do, um, when I had trauma that came into my life, instead of just boxing myself in in uh, in an emotional wall where I keep people out, I started to grow the physical wall around myself to keep myself protected. And I don't know that I that I intentionally did. So it wasn't an intentional thing, but over time, um, the harder it was to get rid of things and to, to make those decisions on what can leave and what can stay. Um, I found myself finding comfort in stuff rather than mm. people and rather than relationships. So rather than growing those relationships where I could get hurt, and I started to grow my walls, my walls of of possessions, and um, until it got so bad that that I could be considered a hoarder, and it was hard for me to see. I still looked at it as just clutter and still um, maybe just a, a bit too much stuff around, but it, it was it did get to that point where I was a hoarder, so it was. Um, yeah, that was that was kind of where I started. Okay, there it's you hit on some interesting things because you talked about your parents split. So, mm-hmm. and I know when you you know when your dad, in which I can relate to my parents splitting um, at an early age, and you don't always get to bring stuff with you and Mm -hmm. sometimes the stuff that you do get to take from one parent's house to the next sometimes the other parent doesn't want it there um so did you find when you went from your dad from your mom's house to your dad's house that you had to get rid of stuff that you brought from you know that way because I know your mom got rid of stuff but was your dad the same way no, my dad, my dad was not that way at all. Actually, he, um, he was very much. I would say, 
maybe this is the wrong thing to say, but you know how gypsies will move all over the place and they're not necessarily, they don't have roots in one place. He right. was, he would travel. He would, uh, he didn't, I remember, I think it was 10 years old and he lived in a hotel room. So for the summer, we'd go visit him in the summer, my brother and, and I, and we stayed in his hotel room and we'd, we'd have adventures from there because he was very much, um, he'd get out and, have adventures. I didn't really have a lot at his place. It was just my clothes and a backpack or a, a suitcase, and that was about it. So nothing really extra that I brought. Um, but I did get a, a love of adventure from him and, and a totally different experience living with him compared to my mom. Hmm. With your with your mom do you think it was intentional or like I don't want stuff from your dad here or do you think it was more that she just didn't like clutter yeah she just she's just a very clean person she doesn't like clutter and extra stuff so if it doesn't have a purpose or a place it's gone Um, and if I outgrew my favorite dress it was gone by the time I got back And, and and really it makes sense to get rid of the things that you've outgrown or that you, that you don't have a use for anymore. But in my young mind, I didn't understand that. So when my favorite dress was gone, when I came home, um, it just made me emotionally cling on to that, that much more. Hmm. So your parents divorce hit, hit you hard. Would you say? It's funny. I actually, I never felt like it did. They, um, they separated when I was six. And I remember they actually told me first, they brought me into their bedroom and said, Angel, because I took things well, I guess at six years old, you kind of do. Um, they brought me into their room and said, Angel, this is what's going to happen. Um, your dad's going to be moving out and we're splitting up. And I looked at dad and I said, don't worry, dad, you'll get back together. And mm. I think he held on to those words for like seven years after. <laughs> so, really, were you close <laughs> to to your dad? Yes, yeah, very much. Yeah. Did you kind of blame your mom? Did you like? No, cause, I don't. You know, as as kids, we I don't know. Maybe it was just me. We tend to maybe take sides or have that quote unquote favorite parent. I know when my parents separated, I don't know why I just, I, I kind of had ideas why, but I was very much a daddy's girl. And to me, everything was my mom's fault. You know, um, I know there was a whole lot that I didn't know that went on behind the scenes, but you know, my dad could do no wrong in in yeah. my eyes. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. And I, I feel like for myself, I just, um, I, I was just this really positive little girl and I didn't quite understand what was, what was happening. Um, dad would often go for work. So for him going away, it didn't quite sink in, I guess, until a couple of years later when I, I saw, okay, he's not here with us. Mom um, dating somebody else. And it just, it's almost like, as a child, you're learning how to live and learning how things work in the world. So, or at least for myself, mm. that um, almost like you just take it in stride. <laughs> like, okay, this is the way it's going now. Um, and yeah, it, you just, you adapt. Kids really adapt at young ages. And I don't know that that's a, a great thing because right. nothing was dealt with, but it's how it was. I think, and I've heard it said, and I've said it myself, that kids are, are resilient, but it's mm-hmm. not it's not often by choice. You know, a lot yeah. of times it's by force, because as a kid, you're, you kind of don't have a say-so. And I think, you know, when I look at different things in my life um, that has happened where I felt helpless or powerless, I think that was one of the things that made me come become a control freak of sorts with the type A personality, things that I've had to deal okay. with 
uh, yeah, very much in which, so I guess I kind of went the opposite of you um, because I kind of went like extra with, with the, with organizing and lists and mm-hmm. everything because I could control that. Mm-hmm. I can, can yes. you know. And I think it's still a, a bit of a control thing because for me, I wanted to control my possessions. I wanted to keep them right. in my possession. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't keeping them in order, but it was a, because it was taken away, I wanted it more. And, and then when I had more say in things, I I didn't allow anybody to take them. So, and then and then I didn't understand how to let go of things myself until later on. So, when was that that moment that you realized that hey, I am keeping too much stuff? And what what label did you put on it? Hmm. Um, well, I I had recognized it long before I made the the um, the permanent change. A lot of, and I I don't know that I put a label on it so much, but um, you know when you're surrounded with things and the kids are embarrassed to bring friends over and I won't open the door to a stranger or anybody that I know because I'm embarrassed to have them inside there's a problem so when I you know when you can see that you I'm not comfortable having my mother over or I'm not comfortable having friends over and my kids are not comfortable having friends over I knew that something had to change and I tried to make those changes, um, but I think inside I didn't feel like that would actually happen. I would work on it. It would feel like too much, and it would be overwhelming, so I'd slip back. And it was this constant, uh, very similar to how a lot of people will um, gain weight and then work on, on losing it and then gain it back and lose it and gain it back. It was a very much very much that... Uh, one step forward, two steps back. Mm. Um, so, it, it, sorry, did and you ask when it changed or? Well, when, when, what was that final straw? Yeah, that, okay. Yeah. So, and yes, the defining moment. Um, and that was actually when my mother, as she often had done many times before, she called me and she said, honey, Angel, you've got to change this. Like, your kids don't deserve this. Mm. They deserve better than this. And I understood that, and I knew that. But instead of feeling like, yes, you're right, Mom, I'll change it, I felt the guilt. And the guilt was like more piling on top of me. And it even made, it, it made things even more difficult to get out of. It's, I liken it to like this big, this hole that I've dug myself into or and physically, it was there. So to dig myself out was just so difficult. And the 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 the, uh, the guilt and the shame that came with that just made it that much harder to get out. So, but she said something different this time. She didn't stop with that. She said, "Angel, you don't deserve this. Mm. You deserve more than this. You're worth." more and that's when everything shifted for me because before then I'm not sure that I understood that I was worth more somewhere along the way I must have believed that I didn't deserve better than this so when my own mother who I love so much said to me angel this is not you you deserve better you're worth more that when I made the decision that I was going to change it no matter what. Whether I knew how to or not, I was going to to change it and I wouldn't make a stop I wouldn't stop until things had been had become better. Hmm. And it's it's funny. Um I love that you compared it to weight gain. And mm-hmm. that kind of back and forth because 
you know, you know, and several of my listeners know that, you know, I would say I failed nine times at losing weight or I, I failed a million and one times before I finally had that defining moment and got it right. Mm -hmm. And, (laughs) and it's, it's a lot of, you know, and that's, that's kind of like life, you know, a lot of times Mm -hmm. you will, you will start and I don't want to say fail, but you will start and not complete. Mm -hmm. you know, and start again and not complete and start again and not complete. But it's the fact that you didn't give up, even though you kind of had to, you know, you had that wake up call from your mom. But in order for that to be a wake up call, you had to already be aware of some stuff, because that's like if, if somebody told me I needed to lose weight, and I didn't feel fat, Mm -hmm. then it's not gonna matter. But if somebody, I knew, oh, your mom, but you had to have some sort of self awareness that you wanted to change or needed to change. You you had some self awareness about that. That's, so yes, very true. Yeah, it's it really always a different way. way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. That really, that that awareness is that number one, isn't it? It's that first step is is awareness of the situation or of wanting to change. And once you've got that awareness, then you've got something to work with. But like you say, if you don't see any issue, well, maybe there isn't an issue. But um, well, maybe maybe there is, but you're not aware of it. So I yeah, agree. That awareness is very important. Mm-hmm. So do you think um, when we talk about your self-worth, do you feel that keeping the things made you more worthy? Like how, how do you feel like your self-worth was tied into what you were doing with keeping stuff? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, I don't know whether it was – that I found the worth in things, but what it was is without feeling worthy of better, mm. um, the the mess around me and the piles around me. Maybe it maybe it is something like that. I hadn't thought of that actually. That maybe my, maybe I was tying my worth to things rather than to myself. Um, yeah, it could it could be that. Um, <laughs> Class is always in session. (laughs) Yes. But what I, what I saw it as, and at that moment where she said, you're worth more than this is just that I was allowing myself to sink further and further into this. And there was a depression there and there was um, just being out of control, even though I wanted to be in control of what I let go and what I didn't, I wasn't letting go of anything. So I was very much in the shackles of my stuff. I was, I was in the prison of my stuff, and I didn't deserve to be there. And that was a, did, that was a revelation for me. Did you feel like you did deserve to be there? Did you feel like you were? you know, un unworthy, I guess maybe that's the word I want to use. Um, like, did you yeah, feel like um, this is the life I deserve? Not consciously, but um, I remember growing up and my dad would always say, you know, you could do anything you put your mind to. And my mom always talked about how beautiful I was and how, you know, I'm, I'm so smart and I can do anything. But then when I became an adult and I wasn't doing these things, I thought, hmm, Okay, I'm not I'm not what they said I am or or I'm not doing I'm not living to my potential, so I'm less than or I'm not I'm not what I could have been. Um so I think I took some self-worth for myself there. J- basically judging mm-hmm. my adult self versus your I could do everything a child hood self yeah as a child 
when they say you've got so much potential and you can do anything and then you don't do anything. <laughs> um, I, I felt like I was letting everyone down, mm. um, not becoming everything that my teachers even said, so much potential, and, you know, so intelligent, all of this, all of these great labels that, you know, should actually lift a person up, but because I didn't do anything with it, um, I put myself down. And I think that's probably where it started. Again, I mean, there's, there's so many, so many layers and so many um, threads that lead up to one thing. So these are some of them. Yeah. Hmm. Did you ever, ever watch the show Hoarders and have you ever watched the show or anyone, any I, of those types of shows? Yeah, yeah, actually my mom brought them to my attention and <laughs> I'd watch them. She'd say, Did you watch it? And I was like, yeah. I said, and I said, I'm not like that mom. Mm. I don't know. You might want to look around a bit. <laughs> I was probably in denial for a lot of it. Uh, although I, I was aware of it not being how it should be. Right. Yeah. And there was probably some detachment um, as a survival mechanism of sorts, because I know yeah. before I was called, um, I never looked at myself as being a control freak. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was a, a steady process of re- realizing some things about me that made me realize that I was, because I would watch shows or talk to people who I thought were control freaks, but I was so detached from it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, no, I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. And, but I was bad right. in my own way. Well, it is our story. When it's our story, we can, we can rationalize anything. Mm. And as far as looking at watching them, the hoarders on those shows, and seeing their junk, I'm not attached to their junk at all. I don't have a story for each little piece of piece of um, material that they've got or every, you know, for my stuff, I had a memory attached to this thing and to that thing. And I had um, a use, potential use for, for <laughs> I had seven rolling pins, no, three rolling pins at one point, and I hadn't used any one of them since I was a kid, like, as an adult, I don't think I made a pie, yet I had three of these rolling <laughs> pins. So, uh, but I, I, if I paid money for it, then there was that money. And if I, if I got rid of it, then it's wasting mm. the money. But if I held on to it, it would, you know, be able to, I would, it would make sense to me to be able to keep it because then my money was being put to good use. It, it, a lot of it didn't make actual sense, but in my state, I rationalized it, so it did. And it made sense to you. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Back then. With the, back, um, back. I was going to mm-hmm. say, with the client that I had years ago, I remember she had like three or four of the exact same brand iron and like seven mm-hmm. or eight coffee pots, and it would be like the, the same brand but what I learned from from her and what what I learned from her is because mom was like that her and her her mom was like that her mom was a hoarder okay yeah and she no go ahead Okay, I was going to say, I know for myself, if I say I bought a a can opener um, because I needed one or I couldn't find my other one, so I bought one. And then that next week, that same can opener was on sale 50% off. Well, dollar cost averaging, it made sense for me to buy another one, even though it really didn't make any sense, um, you know, in the, in the everyday scheme of things it didn't make sense for me to own two of the exact same can openers but somehow in my head it made sense to buy the cheaper one 
So under I I understand. I I understand that as I talk to you and even that in Canada when I talk to you, it gave me a sense of understanding. Especially, mm-hmm. you know, when you talked about going from one house to the other and you know, and your parents, you know, your mom throwing stuff away, but it made sense to her. And with yeah. and my mom was a paper keeper. I don't know if hoarding would be the exact, you know, the term, but I know there's levels to everything, but she was a a paper, I call it a, she was a paper keeper, like random paper. And my sister is the exact same way with random paper. Mm -hmm. And right. There's there's levels to it. Now, my mom yeah. probably would not have considered herself a hoarder, and my sister yeah. neither, but I've actually called my sister a hoarder, just oh, with okay, the random, yeah. random paper. But again, if we go back to my childhood, it was that separation that we have mm-hmm. may have taken two separate, two different ways. Yeah, yeah. And there's so, fear of go of something if you think that it might come in Mm. useful later on or you might need it later on there's a bit of a fear of getting rid of it especially with Mm. the papers understood so Mm. let's talk about healing when you when you had that conversation with your mom and Mm -hmm. you was like okay that's my wake-up call some stuff has to change where did you go from there. Okay, I actually I I just when I made that decision, it was different than all the other times I'd made that decision. It was it was different in that I was completely focused and I wasn't going to listen to all the the reasons of why I couldn't do it even if it came from inside my own head. I wasn't going to listen to it. I was just going to go forward until it was done. Um, so I thought I knew I knew that needed to start with me, with me making that decision and having that unwavering resolve to do it. But I didn't think I could do it alone. So I looked. Um, I remember I googled hoarders, and I wanted to find somebody who'd written a book, someone who had been where I was and wrote a book about it and had come out on the other side. But I couldn't find it. I, I actually couldn't even find one example of a recovered hoarder, written a book or not. I couldn't find any of that. So I did, you know, the thing that made the most sense, which is wrote my own book. <laughs> um, I picked up my, had my computer, and I wrote my thoughts down. Sometimes when you can see things from an outside point of view, it makes more sense. You can see things clearer. I was able to look at my thoughts and pick them apart, like like what I just did moments ago about the can openers. The way that I was thinking was if I if I bought this thing, a seven dollar can opener, and then I see it later on, fifty percent off, three fifty. Um, I better buy that because it's going to be it's cheaper, and then it's like I, it's like it's like I paid less than seven for the first one but that's not actually how it works. When I actually wrote that down and I saw it in writing, um, I was able to look at it from an outside perspective and say this this is not making sense. So here is where I'm going to have to make some adjustments in my thinking. And I went through, I decided to document my journey. So from the first day, uh, I wrote, I wrote, I can't, I can't. It, it, it started actually about seven years ago. So um, I started the book about seven years ago, and then I put it down uh, after the death of my father. And I put it down for five years, six years, mm. um, and then I finished it. So back then, um, you know, I, I had a great example of how to keep a clean home and how to throw things out from my mom. I did have that, 
so I, I was able to draw on that. Um, and I wrote the journey. I wrote what I was feeling, what I was thinking, what, I was, what my accomplishments were, what my progress was, and what my um, backslides were when I, when I slipped back because it's not just a straightforward journey. And I think that's pretty much the same with anything. There might be some, some steps forward, but instead of having a step forward and two steps back, it was two steps forward, one step back, mm. three steps forward, two steps back. You know, it was, it was, um, overall, I was making progress and I was documenting it so I could look back and see what's working and what's not working. What do I need to start doing differently? And by writing this book, I was able to clarify a lot of things for myself and, before I understood that there were coaches out there in the world that could help me through this process and mentors and, and uh, people that could help me on the journey. And I, I actually think that I was too proud to involve anybody else. Mm. Um, this book helped me through that. It became what I needed in somebody else. I love that. Thank I also you. love that you you went looking for what you needed, saw it wasn't there, and created it. Yeah, that's it's pretty cool, actually, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, I'm pretty proud of myself for that. <laughs> you, you are a pretty awesome lady. A lot of people, I think, a lot of people would have given up. You know, when they, have, you know, yeah. not seeing, because yeah. like if I, if I thought, okay, I have a certain problem and if I went mm-hmm. looking for a solution to the problem and saw that there wasn't a solution out there, then my mind would say, okay, well, this must not really be a problem. Did you battle yeah. with that? Were you like, well, maybe I, maybe everybody's making it up. Maybe this is not even really <laughs> a problem because there's no book. There's go if Google can't find it, it doesn't exist. That's what my head would have said. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I actually thought back then. I, I don't get me wrong. I had been I had been there before before I was completely committed to fixing this. I had been there many times, but it was almost back then. It was like looking for an excuse of why this isn't going to work. Whereas mm. after I made the commitment that this is what's going to happen no matter what, it didn't matter that I couldn't find the answer. I knew that it would happen eventually. I just, there was no other choice. There is one path, and there might be a whole bunch of crap on the road to get past it and to get to my destination, but I was getting to that destination. So I remember when I, when I saw that it wasn't there and wasn't available, I thought, okay, I'm going to have to do this on my own. But I also thought this could be, I could, maybe I have something here. This resource isn't available to other people, and I know that I'm not the only one who's in this position. Right, because by that time they had shows. Well, they had the shows. To me, those shows aren't giving an answer. They're not giving a solution. Right. That's looking for somebody else to come in and take care of your mess, and then it's going to come back. When you don't deal with what's on the inside, Mm. it will continually come back. So that wasn't a solution for me. They actually did have those hoarding shows back then, too, and that was not – that's like trying to – clean a glass but washing the outside instead of cleaning the inside. You've got to take care of the inside first. Wow. Powerful statement. Powerful statement. And then even if you keep up with those shows, you will see what the people go through or you will see a lot of them go back. But like you said, they're not yeah. dealing with the, with the issue. They're not right. dealing with the issue. The issue isn't the stuff. It's the person who's going through it. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, you could if if we put you into that when I lived in the, in a trailer with stuff all around me taking over my trailer. If we put you in there, you wouldn't become a hoarder. You'd have right. that place cleaned up in like probably two months. <laughs> but it's the person. It's it's the person who's going through that that needs to to get healing for them from the inside out. Mm. So, okay, number one, go ahead and drop the name of the book and where they can okay. get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's called Careful Where You Set This Down, A Strategic Guide to Heal the Hoarder in You. And I actually named that while I was writing it because I looked around my house and I thought, oh, boy, <laughs> I better be able to find this later on. Mm. Yeah, Makes sense. Kind of funny, yeah, <laughs> kind of a funny, lighthearted, sort of lighthearted title. Um, and that is found on Amazon. So it's careful where you set this down. And then the uh, subtitle is Strategic Guide to Heal the Hoarder in You. And I actually have two books out. One is this, um, and the other is a companion guide. I don't even remember the exact title, but it's careful where you set this down, a companion guide. And it takes the steps. So I looked at feedback for other books mm-hmm. because now there are other books, but not. I still don't see them written by hoarders or pa- previous um, recovered hoarders. Um, and a lot of the feedback I read is that people aren't telling you steps. There's no steps to be able to get out of this. So I took my book and I took all the stories out and I just took the steps and I made it a condensed version and it's cheaper. So it's, but to me, the bigger book is, um, has what's going to make the lasting change. So you guys hear that you need to get both of them careful (laughs) where you set this down, a strategic guide to heal the hoarder in you by Miss Angel Peterson on Amazon (laughs) and make sure you get the companion guide with the steps and y'all know I'm all about the steps and tips and everything. So if, if a hoarder or someone that may recognize some behaviors in themselves, if they're listening, what would you, Mm -hmm. what, what would be the number one tip you give them? To know that or the first get tip. The first, the first is just to, to, to know that it doesn't have to remain this way for the rest of your life. You can recover and you can get out of this and live a nice life in a beautiful home that's taken care of. Hmm. It's, that, it's that mindset shift that people have to go through because if you don't realize it's a problem like really Mm -hmm. realize it's a problem then nothing and and that goes for hoarding or any behaviors or anything you have until you realize it's a problem it's not going to change yeah and here's another and it's in the book but it's it's that the things that have value shouldn't be things mm. in your life. The, the, what makes lives so much richer are the relationships we have with each other. And if you're hiding from those relationships by surrounding yourself with stuff, or even if you're just hiding yourself out in your room and not getting out there and not seeing people, not meeting people, not, not blossoming those relationships, then you're missing out on stuff. You're, you're missing out on what your life could be and the difference that you could make in somebody else's life and the difference they can make in yours. As so you were balance, going, I was going to say, as you were going through this process, because now not only are you a recovered hoarder, you're an author, a speaker, and a coach. Did you see it going yeah. that way? No, no, not at all, actually. Um, <laughs> I've, I've been acting in plays for the last 20 years off and on just for fun. Um, 
and I guess that sort of relates to speaking, but not really. I, I never thought I'd, I never, actually, I never thought I'd be a speaker. Um, as far as a coach, I, I've always, my name is Angel. I've mm-hmm. always taken it seriously. I've loved helping other people as much as I can, however I can. I, I'd like I liked being able to help people. Um, becoming a coach is still fairly new to me, other than than um, on a non what's the word? Uh, just on, on a kind of a casual sense, I've been helping people, but um, as a profession, it's just been the last year and. I took a took a wonderful course, and it made such an impact on my life. And I wanted to be able to use those tools to be able to help other people as well. Um, and the book kind of, you know, it it's funny that I didn't see it because now looking back, it really does make sense. I paved the way for myself, and hopefully, I'll have pay, I'll be paving the way for many others to get out of their their um, their clutter and their prison of of things. Hmm. And you never know, you may end up on the show hoarders to actually be the person that help the people, because I can imagine that it would probably be more helpful if the person helping them have experience versus doctors and judgmental, quote unquote, people that have no experience with living that way. So you never know. And Just send me a shout out. My... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. And my heart goes out so strongly towards those people who are going through what I had because I know how much of a, just a burden it all was and how nice it is to be free from that. So I'd love to be able to help more people with that, to get out of that. And I and I predicted it, so just remember today. Yeah. <laughs> so <It's volunteer. laughs> Yes, on Define You Radio, today is what, the seventh eighteenth? I don't 18th know what today is. <laughs> the eighteenth of July, I predict that Angel will be on a show helping hoarders and she will give me a shout out. <laughs> <laughs> So I second that. You second that, yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you find that people don't take it seriously um, as it is, or as serious as it is? Um, sorry, can you can you elaborate on the question? Meaning, from from watching the show, if somebody mm-hmm. watches the show, it's kind of almost I don't want to say like a joke. Right. Um, no, it is. And it, it is treated like it's not not it treated the people who are going through this and who are who are afflicted with being hoarders are treated like jokes and it's it's so unfortunately unfortunate and um it is it's it's definitely something mental that there like a mental illness um that they're going through dealing from ex- speaking from experience and it's not like I think the worst thing you could do is treat the person like they're a joke because they probably treat themselves like they're a joke in many times hmm. they deserve respect and they deserve to be taken seriously so and they deserve compassion we need more compassion in this world so yes I I I do believe it's um it's looked at like somebody we can make fun of so we can feel better about ourselves. Mm. And to me, someone who's got that mentality has got to find a better way to feel better about themselves because there's a self-worth issue in and of itself. They're worth more than that. And I really... Mm -hmm. And I love that you said that it is at the root, some um, 
mental illness or some mental issue going on there, but we wouldn't make, you wouldn't see a show or maybe you would now it's about people that's bipolar or schizophrenic or something like that. Like that would not be a laughing matter. No, could you imagine that? Yeah. Could you imagine them following somebody around who's, 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 um, who's a schizophrenic? And them laughing at them or making light of what they're going through. It's it, um, that's one thing that I don't like watching those shows for. Um, and they're, they're not all like that, but I've seen it where. Um, and probably what it is is the people who are who love those people don't know how to deal with it other than to joke or laugh about it. Mm. It just guys, makes it some, sometimes easier. Definitely as as a show and as a community, we should all care about others and work to understand other what other people are going through. So I agree. Take notes, class is always in session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Angel, I, okay, I have one question. I do have one one mm-hmm. more question. Um, now, since you have healed from from hoarding, since you are now a recovered hoarder, are you saving mm-hmm. money? Um, or did you I find that you started am. to? Well, I bought a house. It's Congratulations. Was, I was I was living in a trailer that was falling apart that rained inside every time it rained outside because the hail had pushed through the, the roof. So and I was too embarrassed to change to get somebody in to fix it. So quality of life has increased phenomenally. And yes, um in, I, I, it's not something I'd thought about, but yeah, in some ways I am saving money. Okay. Yeah. You know, it <laughs> normally like when someone changes a behavior that affects them outwardly, I guess. Um like if you think mm-hmm. about someone that's a shopaholic and when yeah. they recover from that cuz somebody like me, I would I wouldn't understand that. Like how can you be addicted? Like how's that a real thing? But I know people that are shopaholics shopaholics and I know when they work on that they do save money you know alcoholism if you recover of course you're saving money because you're no longer buying the alcohol yeah and I have to say like there's times when I'm out shopping and I have to talk myself out of that past way of thinking still Mm. like sometimes I'll be shopping and I'll think oh look at this cool thing and and then I'll be like oh wait a minute do I really have a use for it? Is it going to come home and just sit there and take up space? Um, Is it going to add to my life? Is it going to improve my life in any way? And if the answer is no, it's not going to improve my life, it stays on the shelf. Um, If I'm, if I'm conscious of it there, I have screwed up and, and bought things that didn't make sense, but um, I'm pretty good about getting rid of things now too. So, if I recognize that it's that it's just not, and I don't have a purpose for it, um, their Salvation Army is always willing to take it off my hands. So, and I, that I think we all can evaluate our purchases more, just from a whole standpoint of the whole big picture. Because I know I could tell you honestly, I have purses on top of my closet that are dusty. And yeah. I refuse to get rid of them because honestly, my mind says, as soon as you get rid of it, you're going to need that purse. And the same with shoes. So mm-hmm. I have to, I'm mindful now. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am and mindful. You, what you might want to do is decide, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to wear those shoes and that, and use that purse um, this day. And then and then do it. If they're beautiful and you're putting off wearing them because you're waiting for a special occasion, you're alive. That's special. Wear it. Use it. 
And if you decide that it's just you don't really like it that much, then maybe it's worth getting rid of. Mm. And that's the nail on the head. Angel, we have like uh, six minutes left in the show. How can the audience connect with you? At the moment, I don't have a website. Um, So my Facebook page is probably the best, Angel Peterson. And there might be other ones. There are other ones. Gosh, (laughs) what is the best way? You know, pick up my book. I think I might even have my phone number in it. No, it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> Pick up my book. Find me on Facebook. If you know Valencia and you're following Valencia, Valencia, you will find me, Angel Peterson. And yes, um, yes you'll find me there. <laughs> Yes, guys, I will make sure you can connect with her. If you go on to find you radios, Facebook page, if you are friends with me or connected with me in any way, shape or form, inbox me and I will link you up. Make sure you get the book. Careful where you set this down. A strategic guide to healing to heal the hoarder in you and I'm going to just add this. I know it's random and not, but I love that you put careful where you set this down. (laughs) Um, And I don't know if maybe it's an American thing, it's a grammar thing or whatever, but, you know, I may have said careful where you sit this down or careful where you, you know, so, but Mm -hmm. you use the, the proper way it's supposed to go. So I just want to throw that out there. Well, I'll pat myself on the back for that one. <laughs> Thank you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think of that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it makes the title stick just because it's just the proper mm-hmm. way it's supposed to be said. So, Angel, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. And welcome oh, I really to. I appreciate you having me. Welcome to the Define You Radio family. I know that you have healed some people, whether it was from hoarding or understanding whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You've helped me to understand my control freakness type A personality Mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, Mm -hmm. Because it was definitely some things I hadn't thought about till our conversation tonight. So I do want to thank you for coming on. (laughs) Wow. I am so thankful you had me here. Thank you so much, Valencia. It was it was such a pleasure. Well, thank you. And guys, if you enjoyed today's session, stay connected by subscribing to the show on iTunes and Google Play. Tonight's quote comes from Manny Hale, and I'm hoping I typed that up right, but it says self worth is so vital to your happiness. If you don't feel good about you, it's hard to feel good about anything else. With that mm-hmm. being said, let us know what you learned from today's show on Define You Radio's Facebook page or join Define You Movement where class is in session seven days a week. Until next time, have a great week. Thanks for listening to Define You Radio. Class is in session. Connect with the show at www.defineuradio.com. Pins and papers down. Class is over. At Hackensack Meridian Health, we believe the best health care is perfectly orchestrated. Researchers working with doctors to treat the most complex conditions. Specialists identifying problems sooner. And everything you need from primary care to emergency care, home health to rehab, is all perfectly in tune. Here, when everyone works together, your world gets better. Hackensack Meridian Health. Life years ahead. At Hackensack Meridian Health, we believe the best health care is perfectly orchestrated. Researchers working with doctors to treat the most complex conditions. Specialists identifying problems sooner. And everything you need from primary care to emergency care, home health to rehab, is all perfectly in tune. Here, when everyone works together, your world gets better. Hackensack Meridian Health. Life years ahead.